Hello everybody, my name is Sue Shardlow, I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today we have got a fireside panel with the Redis documentation team. So we've got Lance, Rachel and Caitlin who are all technical writers here at Redis, here to demystify the world of technical writing and documentation for you. And the reason why we have timed it for October is because we're currently in the middle of Hacktoberfest, and I know that some of you are taking part in Hacktoberfest. What we've done here at Redis is we set up a little area on the internet, developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest, where you'll find all the repos that we've made available for you to participate in. And so documentation is often cited as a good way for new open source contributors to get their feet wet with open source. And so we are releasing over the course of October just sort of drip feeding gradually a number of different issues relating to parts of our software, demo apps and documentation for you to get involved with. So please do check out developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest to find out more about that. So back onto the live streams. This is the first of four live streams that I'm doing with the documentation team. Today, we've got the panel with the whole team and then week commencing Monday, the 25th of October, we've got a set of one-to-one um fireside chat so first up on monday is caitlin and me and then on tuesday the 26th six we've got rachel and me and then on friday the 29th it's me and lance so yeah please do diarize for that or follow us here on twitch to get a notification when we go live so on to today's event then like i said it's a panel discussion what i'm going to do is i've got a number of questions here that i have pre prepared um, but what I'd really love, love is if you good folks would say in the chat what questions you would like me to put to these um, colleagues here on the documentation team and we'll get through as many of them as we can. So we're going to start off with a really gentle question. Hopefully everybody knows the answer to this. Even Mindy, who is currently hanging out on Caitlin's shelf, <laughs> <laughs> trying to climb out. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to ask everybody here. Um, well, what your name is, what you do, and just briefly, what you're currently working on. So I'm going to come to Rachel first. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So um, I'm Rachel Elledge. I'm a technical writer at Redis. And um, my main focus lately has been kind of split partially between doing infrastructure for our docs website. Um, and I've also been working on some REST API documentation a lot lately. Um, so that's coming up. Cool. Those are Thank probably you. the main things. Do a little dabbling in some other areas. So. Yeah, cool. Thanks. And um, Caitlin and Mindy. Hello. I'm Caitlin, and uh, this is this is Mindy. Um, she <laughs> likes it to to um, hijack meetings. Um, I am a technical writer at Redis. I joined in January of 2021, um, and I am currently working on our uh, documentation for our Kubernetes operator. Cool. Thanks, Caitlin. And Lance? Hi, I'm Lance Leonard. Um, I'm also a tech writer uh, at Redis. Um, I've been there about a month longer than Caitlin. So we're all a fairly young team here. Um, and I work on all the stuff that they're not working on. So right now I'm working on uh, documentation for the new uh, Redis Cloud experience. I'm working on documentation for Redis Insight. I'm working on documentation of trying to improve our install upgrade docs and all of the rest of the stuff. Cool, yeah. And also Lance manages the team. So Lance has got managerial responsibilities as well. And if you want to find out more about how to sort of go from technical writing to managing technical writers, join us on Friday 29th of October when me and Lance will be doing a one-to-one -one fireside chat. We go into that into more detail. So yeah, in the meantime, thanks Pixel Perfection saying hooray for Doctober. I've not heard that phrase before. So that's really cool. <laughs> I love um, it. Yeah, me that's too. Awesome. I think we should we should do that every every year. But like November's like uh, national write what was it national novel writing month or something yeah nano rimo or whatever yeah yeah I don't so know. <laughs> the way you're supposed to pronounce it but <laughs> yeah october and november now definitely can be like mm -hmm. two two writing months it's I yeah i think it's national yeah. novel writing month or something yes yeah, yeah. and yeah. people do change it so they can do blogging or yeah. whatever it suits them because writing a novel is a bit of a task isn't it yeah. But um, yeah, so anyone here who is on the stream, please do let us know where you are dialing in from today. We always love to know how 
how far our reach has gone. So yeah, please do that. So the first question I'm going to put to all three of you, and I'm going to come to Caitlin first, I think this time, is how do you describe your job to people who aren't in tech? Um, the way that I usually describe it is um, I translate engineer. Um, and, uh, you know, I tell people I, I write manuals, you know, like when you get instructions in a box uh, for something that you bought, but um, we do it for really complex stuff. And um, the engineers give us really good information, but, you know, they're not trained writers. So, um, yeah, that's usually how I describe it. Cool. Yeah, I like that, actually. And what I've noticed recently, because I've just bought uh, a few bits and pieces of hardware. And what I've noticed recently is the manual is not what it used to be. So, you know, back in the 90s, you'd buy a new piece of hardware and you get a whole book. And now it's like maybe just a sheet of paper with some pictures on. So, yeah, it is, it is really odd. But um, yeah, and what's really interesting about you as well as the way you came into this whole thing, which we'll explore while we do the one to one with you on the 25th but um yeah i like that you translate you translate for the engineers so rachel how would you describe your job to folks that aren't in tech yeah so normally i just say something along the lines of um well i write instructions and explain how software works um sometimes work on different like tools that people can use or like help people figure out how to do things on the website um and then additionally like if they interested, um, I can tell them a little bit about like, oh, I help like actually get our docs onto the website itself that we have. So yeah, I think yeah. that is a really good way of framing it as well. If you have to describe what you do is to tell people who you help and how you're helping them. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and people who use any type of software or hardware, especially now, like I just said, the hardware doesn't come with any instructions. Mm -hmm. You have to go to a website to find what you want. So everybody can relate to having to go and search for that stuff. And I think, I don't necessarily think about where it comes from, do they? Cool, and Lance, same question. How would you describe your job to people that aren't in tech? Well, usually I uh, put it in terms of, well, I teach people how to, well, now Redis. Um, and then I go into a little more detail. Um, I, really sort of a simple way of looking at it, but it starts the conversation and then they're like, oh, how do you do that? Oh, well, we do it through um, writing content. We do it through creating examples. We do it through making sure that what's there is simple and easy to understand. So, you know, it's not just writing. It's also a lot of uh, design and analysis and review and sometimes what I call barnacle scraping, cleanup. That's good old barnacles, yeah. Yeah, and you're right, it's a definite skill that not everybody can do, but I think a lot of people could develop. And I think that's what I'd like to explore with you as well. There's going to be some budding tech writers here, or maybe software engineers, or maybe writers who aren't technical, who want to get into technical writing and kind of want to know how to do that. So I'm going to stay with you, Lance. Um, you touched on a few different things there. And we talk about technical writing and your team is mostly focused on documentation, but there are different kinds of technical writing, aren't they? So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, we've got documentation, we've got tutorials, they're very different things. What are the different kinds of technical writing that people could get involved with? Um, wow, that's a big one. Um, I would say that uh, in part, it depends on the audience that you're, you wanna focus on. You can divide things up into things like, um, well, using Microsoft's traditional definitions, you've got consumer, administrator, and developer. Um, when you look at a piece of information from the point of view of you're trying to troubleshoot why it's not working on your machine, you might want a particular piece um, targeted for that sort of troubleshooting. If you've got a bit of code that's being bulky, um, you would want different types of troubleshooting steps. Now, I'll admit, I have a tendency to not look at things quite that um, delineated because I think in tech, things are moving so much and so quickly that a lot of times we find ourselves shifting between these roles um, almost in the same sentence. So you might be trying to write a script to automate a small piece and it's not working and maybe it's a registry setting or maybe it's something that needs to be a dependency that's missing or maybe it's a bit of code that's badly written. 
So one of the things I do when I approach work is to say, okay, how can I make this specific to this audience, but also relevant to people who don't have the background? Um, so that's one vector. Another vector is to uh, look at things that interest you. Um, if you're into databases, uh, then, you know, look at the Redis docs if they're open source. If you're into uh, spreadsheets, well, there's LibreOffice. There's all of the other open source things. Um, I would say the biggest thing is to find something that you find interesting because that will create your engagement. And then you'll go beyond whatever borders that people are trying to throw in your way. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. And I think you can apply that same advice if you're, you know, a lot of people want to know how to get into programming, don't they, and coding. Um, and, you know, the, the off-cited advice is find a project that you're interested in and then find the tools that you would need to build that project. Because if you've got right. something that you're interested in, you're more likely to be able to learn and apply that knowledge. Right. Cool. Okay. So, Caitlin, I'm going to ask you then about the different types of documentation or different types of technical writing. Um, I think people just look at technical writing and they think, okay, that's just one one thing, one skill set. It's it's the same. You can go and figure out how to learn Zoom. And if you read the docs, if you read the, the tutorials, it's the same thing. What would you say with the main differences between documentation and tutorials? Because they're not really the same thing, are they? No, I think it's all about like what medium is going to be the most effective to teach the audience what they want to know. So um, sometimes things are better explained in videos, um, with photos. Um, I used to do uh, hardware documentation for uh, computers and um, videos and photos were much more effective than any words that I could put on the page. Um, because yeah, you would have to describe like the, the slightly light green chip here on the in the right corner instead of just like showing them. Um, and you actually see this in um, I think it's Legos um, documentation is all photos and um, Ikea. Yeah, yeah, and Ikea. <laughs> um, so it all depends on how people learn. And, you know, sometimes interactive tutorials are a better way to do it. Um, the medium really depends on the content. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I like the way you kind of highlighted their Lego, because obviously that is a truly international company, isn't it? And by using photographs, you're keeping, you're using that kind of universal code, if you like, that most people are going to understand. And you're avoiding the internationalized stuff like you don't have to translate into several different languages. So as long as you mm -hmm. can really get that down and make it into a thing that most people can understand, then it can save you a lot of time and money, I guess. So, Rachel, I'm going to come to you now. I'm going to ask you probably the biggest question of the day. <laughs> what is documentation and why is it important? Because you see a lot of software out there and there isn't any mm -hmm. documentation and we have a whole team dedicated to documentation. So talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. So I would say the big thing with documentation is it's a collection of information about products and services that helps explain like how to install them, how to do setup, how to perform specific tasks that a user or administrator or developer would like to complete. Um, and yeah, you want to have it written in a way that is easy for someone to dive into. Well, uh, hopefully it's easy. <laughs> you want people to have a better experience than you had trying to research and figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's a lot of different um, things you can document. So like sometimes you'll have more reference material uh, rather than being like a tutorial. So like um, say you have like a command line tool or like the REST API. Um, in those cases, you will have just like a reference where it has all the information you need for someone to just go and look up. I want to do this very specific command. Um, what are my options that I can apply to this command? What are some examples? Things like that. Um, and then on the other side of things, like we've already kind of talked about, um, sometimes you have some tutorials. Um, quick starts are pretty popular for um, people who are brand new. It's like very basically It'll be like, here's the prerequisites. Like, this is what you need to install first. Um, here's how to like get the small project set up. And like, here's a quick example that you can just, you know, just jump into real fast to get you familiar. Um, so yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for that. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that anyone watching would really appreciate it too, because like I said, not everybody has a documentation team. Not everybody has people writing documentation. Not even everybody writes a read me <laughs> yeah. for their repos, which is probably kind of like the, the least you could do for somebody if you want them to use your software. So yeah, thanks so much mm -hmm. for giving us a few different examples because it doesn't have to be a really big, scary thing that you're going to write huge volumes of stuff. So like you say, a quick start guide mm -hmm. could actually be something that is very useful and gets most people on the road to using mm -hmm. what you've produced. So um, yeah, one thing I do want to highlight at, at this point now, it's quite timely because Lance's cat has joined us now for the stream, is that the documentation team is a, a team that you have to have a cat if you want to join this team. So <laughs> if any of the folks there ever want to come work for us when we're hiring, make sure you get a cat first and then uh, <laughs> Lance will definitely put your CV up a pile that is going to be considered. <laughs> So, um, well, I don't know if I'd say that, but uh, <laughs> it's a bonus. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a bonus. Yeah, you, you won't get rejected if you've got a cat. So, um, Lance, I'm going to come to you for this one. So, we talked a little bit about documentation generally and the kind of things that you all are working on at the moment. But who is the target audience for the Redis documentation? The main target audience is uh, the um, administrator. That is somebody who is trying to, uh, re who is responsible for the care and feeding of a Redis deployment, specifically around Redis Enterprise software or Redis Enterprise cloud. Uh, it's a little weird to say that about cloud because one of the advantages of cloud over the software product is, or the on-prem product, is that we do the administration. Nevertheless, there's still a lot of care and feeding that goes into deploying, especially on a uh, large scale. So those are our primary audiences. Now, having said that, um, I talked earlier about the different types of documentation. We're also trying to, uh, we're aware that a lot of our documentation was written by experts, mainly for experts. And one of the things that uh, we're working really hard to do is to help people get up that learning cliff, as opposed to a learning curve, um, much more quickly and with a lot less hassle. So like Rachel said, that we um, have people learn this stuff far uh, more quickly and more easily than we did or are so yeah um, yeah that's, question. yeah definitely because like you say you know what it's like to be new at it and you have recent experience um yeah. whereas i guess some people that maybe have been in the job a long time could forget what it's like to be new to it so you all have the advantage of yeah. that yeah and, you know, it's things like, well, step back and go, okay, there's this thing I'm supposed to run. I don't have that. How do I get it? And then you have to chase down a lot of different people to get the straight answer of, oh, this is what we're supposed to tell them about where to get it. Okay, got it. And then magically it appears in the docs. Yeah, that happens a lot um, where engineers just kind of take a, a given step for granted, like, oh, everyone will know how to do this. Um, and we're the people that say like, wait, how, how did you get from point A to point B? There has to be a step in between there. Uh, and then they're like, oh, well, I just, I thought everyone would know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. how we make things more beginner friendly, um, in one way. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I remember doing a similar chat with an engineering manager and I asked her if she likes to code for pleasure. And she said she tries to, and she goes on to tutorials, but they always seem to step start at like step two. Mm -hmm. So there's always this huge assumption that you know how to get to the start line with these things. And that isn't necessarily the case. And I think that is a barrier to people to getting started, really, if they can't see how to do it and they can't find it anywhere, not even from a third party, then you know, it's it they're not gonna try, but also it's just really hard to figure it out yourself sometimes. Right. right. And I think you bring up an important point. That's one of the things we're really working hard to do is make sure we've got that pathway laid out so that as users choose their own path, even if we don't put the direction in the content, there's a link to where you can learn more. Yes. Yeah, it is definitely useful if you can do that, because even if that place is explaining the same thing that you're explaining, it's explaining it in a different way. And sometimes just hearing it in a different way or reading it in a different way uh, just makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? It just it clicks with you and people take information in, in different ways. And 
sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right wording, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to break up the uh, the pace a little bit with a little quick fire round. It's just four little questions, which hopefully are really easy. <laughs> I'm going to come to Rachel. Mm -hmm. Just whatever comes into your head first. Favorite word? Um, I really like the word bewildered. <laughs> that is a nice word. Yeah. yeah, it's quite wholesome. It says such a lot, doesn't it? And your yeah. favorite book? My favorite what? Book. Book, okay. Um, yeah, so Fan of the Opera is probably my favorite book. Um, honorable mention for The Invisible Man, because that one's really good too. Uh, by H.G. Wells. I know there's like multiple books called The Invisible Man. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Need to check that out. I haven't read that, but I think sometimes it's going good. back to the classics is, yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. And your favorite site for writing resources? Like, you know, what kind of thing are you using on a daily, weekly basis to help you in your job? Hmm. Well, it's not exactly like <laughs> writing resource but so i am always on like the hugo documentation website because we use hugo to do our static site generation for a doc site and it's just got lots of references of all these different commands and stuff um, that i can integrate into our site so that's very helpful from an like infrastructure <laughs> perspective yeah. which has been one of my focuses lately um aside from that this is something that gets recommended a lot um especially to new technical writers um which like I have just recently transitioned in this past year to technical writing from software development. So um, everybody kept recommending write the docs um, websites and blogs. Um, they have a lot of information that is helpful um, getting people who are new to technical writing acclimated. So cool. Yeah, thanks for that. And write the docs also have a Slack as well. So <laughs> if anyone wants to join that, um, I'm sure Simon will put the link in the chat. And the final question and then this quick cry round. What's better, a good product with bad docs or a bad product with good docs? Mm. <laughs> I, I, I don't think either one's very nice. That, <laughs> hmm. Like you don't want to have a bad product because then it's like, okay, great. This doesn't do anything that I want. But at the same time, if you have a good product that's not documented well, it's going to be really frustrating for the users and they might just give up. They might be like, OK, well, maybe that's high potential, but I have no idea how to use it. And like, I don't want to have to like constantly go on like like forums and stuff to ask or like go and bother customer support constantly just to figure out small things. Um, so. Yeah, I don't like either of those options. <laughs> no, there's no right answer there. There's no right answer. I just didn't know whether you know if you had to choose, but yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to come to Caitlin now. Um, what are some commonly held beliefs about technical writing that aren't true? Um, I guess. Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, commonly held beliefs that we know everything automatically without being told. Um, a lot of people are like, hey, we're missing this piece of information. And then you're like, okay, great. I don't have it. <laughs> um, you need to give it to me. So, Yeah, yeah, I think you can say that for a lot of jobs in tech, a bit like, you know, coder. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that a coder can just sit down on their laptop and just start typing out the code without ever looking anything up and just sit there and produce a whole lab. <laughs> like, no, it doesn't work that way. So. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll come on to it later. But I, yeah, I want to talk to you all about what happens if you get a job on a piece of software that you've never used before. But I think that kind of links in what, with what you've just been saying. So um, yeah, Lance, I'm going to come to you for this one now, because you're managing the team and you have set up this team and you've kind of set up the, the ways and the processes with Rachel and Caitlin about how documentation is going to work at Redis. So how do you establish and maintain a set writing style for documentation? Because, you know, you you want to make sure stuff is consistent and documentation probably isn't the time for everybody to individually bring in personality to it. So how do you maintain a, a set writing style for documentation? Um, well, sort of like a good software project, we depend on an existing library. Specifically, um, we use the Google Developer Documentation Style Guide as our baseline. I happen to be a little bit familiar with that because it was uh, developed uh, by people that I've worked with previously. And so to complement that, we also use 
the, oh, hello, Simon. <laughs> um, we also use the Microsoft Writing Style Guide as a support. Um, oh, both organizations have, invented, uh, have invested an enormous amount of time into research, developing the current style that they use, and so we rely on that. We try to make decisions that are data-driven um, rather than gut feel. Um, so to that end, we try to create content that is accessible. That is, it's not just words, it's not just actions on one experience, but it's something that's open and available to people coming in from all sorts of input devices and experience levels, uh, things of that nature. Um, and also, these are things that we uh, have learned from Write the Docs. Um, who also posts videos of all of their conference sessions. They do conferences across the world. So if anybody's trying to get into it, I heartily endorse them, which is something I rarely do. Um, so yeah, uh, enforcing that is basically first, we make sure that we hire people that are already very close to that um, style and tone. Um, there's a mindset that goes with it. Uh, and it shows up in the writing samples. Both Caitlin and Rachel had excellent writing samples. Um, it was very fun to read their stuff. I've read writing samples that are less um, amusing. Um, let's put it that way. So it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, and to go back to your myths question, I would say the biggest one is that writing is uh, one and done. Writing is never finished. Like software, it needs care and maintenance um, because the minute you change the bits, the writing's out of date and users hate it. So, anyway, yeah, yeah, I think that, a little bit there. that definitely is a, a common misconception. And I'm sure a lot of companies hiring a writer at one point to write everything and just on a contract basis and they say, see ya. And then, uh, yeah, they, they don't ever maintain that and kind of uh, look after it, do they? Yes, I think that's very true. So Rachel, I'm going to come to you for this one. You mentioned earlier about the Hugo documentation because you're mm -hmm. using Hugo, which is a static site generator. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us a little bit more about other tooling that you use in your job? Okay, sure. Um, so besides having Hugo as our static site generator, we also use things like Circle CI to do basically continuous integration and deployment. So um, oh, I guess I should also mention, our uh, docs project is hosted on GitHub. So basically we have, um, whenever we push updates to our branches on GitHub, um, we have that tied into our Circle CI automation and it will build our project, um, all of the HTML files, everything that we need, and then it will deploy it um, to our, um, what well, we use AWS S3 to host um, our static site. So it'll push it there as well. Um, Additionally, um, we are going to be adding some testing um, features, hopefully, you know, to the deployment process as well to improve our um, testing process. Um, so yeah, uh, those are big things. Um, doo -doo -doo. I guess additionally, like um, these are kind of like side tools uh, that we use a lot are like um, bash command line. Um, is obviously really important for us. Uh, we also use um, VS Code a lot of times uh, to do our actual editing. And um, Hugo is actually really nice. Well, I'm, all the static site generators, I think, do this. I, I, I can't guarantee that because I'm not as familiar with the other ones. But um, as we update um, our docs locally um, in VS Code, we can watch um, like the changes get applied and like what it will look like. We have a preview that we can watch. Um, as we make changes. So that's really nice and very helpful to, you know, get an idea of what something's going to look like before we push it to GitHub. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that people don't realize that, and it might be that some folks that are watching are thinking you fire up a Google doc and you type in your documentation into there and you maybe PDF it and then put it somewhere. So maybe they don't realize there's like this whole process and it's actually integrated into a project and you may be writing stuff in Markdown or some, yes, some yes, format. Yes, Markdown. Yeah, you're using some format like that, which is really mm -hmm. versatile, especially like you say, if you're using static site generator, 
And in the future, if you wanted to use a different one, then you can easily pull that stuff across, can't you? Cool. Depending on which one you move to, yes. Yeah, like, <laughs> I haven't yeah, ever done a migration, so yeah, some of it might be rough, but yeah. hopefully yeah. not too bad. <laughs> yeah, I guess it gives you a, a, a decent chance that maybe... You maybe have a yeah. start. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So kind of a, a standard format, if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, so um, one phrase that people talk about in this industry, in this profession, is docs as code. Caitlin, is that something you can talk to us about? Because you've had a couple of jobs now, uh, you've had a few jobs in technical writing. Is this something that you've used before or are currently used maybe? Um, yes and no. Uh, I've had, basically the principle for docs as code is that the um, documentation is written into the software um, and then generated out of that. Um, and I've, I've worked on some projects that did that um, and, and some that didn't. Um, it gives you a certain amount of control or, you know, like ease of use with, you know, in because the documentation is right in the software, but also, you know, we don't, you don't have as many tools available um, sometimes like the tools that we use. So um, it really depends on the scope um, as well and your audience um, but it's it's kind of cool because like as a technical writer you know if you're used to working in you know your own tools and your own repos and stuff to actually get to be part of the software project and you know contribute to it and have your work be part of the product yeah yeah, and hopefully give you a fighting chance as well of your code being updated with the versions of the software when necessary, because like you say, it's integrated into that project, isn't it? So software, sorry, documentation isn't a, like a nice to have, but somebody thought, yeah, we'll do that. And then we just forget about it. It's that once and done thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. We're going to do the next quick fire round. I'm going to come to Lance next and Lance's cat. <laughs> <laughs> Lance, what's your favorite word? Squishy. Oh, nice. That's such onomatopoeia there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and your favorite book? Uh, it's like asking me to choose my favorite child, Kindle. Or your favorite cat. Your favorite book's your Kindle. Oh, that's cheating. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kindle works on my phone. Um, so when I, my daughter was younger and I was following her across the state to uh, championships, I had something. I didn't have to carry a stack of books in my back pocket while I was waiting for the games to start. That's true. Yeah. And if you're moving house, then it's so much easier just to take a Kindle with you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to remember that answer next time somebody says, <laughs> I like that one. It's the best one I've heard. And what's your favorite site for writing resources? What, what sites are you using regularly to help you with your job? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, it depends on the, the purpose. Uh, we talked earlier about the uh, uh, doc style guides from uh, Google and Microsoft. Um, you know, uh, Google, Bing, those are big ones. Stack Overflow, Write the Docs is a good resource. Uh, I also like the Purdue OWL site, Online Writing Lab because it's free <laughs> and it has a lot of information on basic writing structures. They have a really good uh, test for testing for uh, passive voice. I also like Hemingway app because it's a quick way to get some metrics on a chunk of text. Just paste it in there and it tells you how many of your sentences are too long and all of the rest of the quick fixes. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah there's there's just a host of them yeah no i do like having away myself as well and those things are good even you if you're just blogging or you're writing a business document too so yeah those things are definitely helpful because sometimes you don't realize the way you've written until you run it through one of these things and it gives you a few pointers so the last question in the quick fire round then what same one to rachel um that i asked rachel earlier so lance what's better a good product with bad docs or a bad product with good docs I would have to say a bad product with good docs because the docs have the opportunity to craft the story. And sometimes what looks like a bad product actually has a design intent and the docs get a chance to carry people through. I can go into more on that one, but uh, like bad docs just suck. Sorry. 
<laughs> I like that. I, I like the fact that you feel str strongly that way. And I did not expect that answer. So thanks for that. <laughs> You've given me a different point of view to think about. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It might just be that it wasn't, you know, like people say it's a bad dog. It's like there's no such thing as a bad dog. It was just the circumstances. It was the environment they were in. So, yeah, it, this, it might not well, be a bad product. Yeah. The other part is your question belies is that there's a difference between the um, design and engineering required for a good doc as there is for a good product. I see them as both being very similar and both requiring the same amount of work. We don't throw release a product and say, okay, we're done with it. We don't need any more programmers. No, we continue to iterate. We have to treat the documentation in exactly the same way. Documentation needs to be a feature, not an afterthought. Definitely, definitely needs to be thought about um, at the beginning, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, throughout. Yeah. So um, I'm going to come to you next, Rachel. So yeah. obviously there's three of you in the docs team. And what I'm imagining is that you don't all sit there together and write your documents sitting down together in a little, well, you know, in a little virtual room, just writing. You do actually speak to other people in the mm -hmm. business to get your jobs done. So I'm imagining really you're mostly part of their, a team of others more than you're necessarily part of the docs team, if you see what I mean, on a day to day basis. So can you talk to us about who the docs team main interfaces mm -hmm. are with within the business? Mm -hmm. So people that we talk to a lot are the product managers. So, um, you know, we have contacts for the cloud product. We have contacts for the software product and they we, we have regular meetings with them where they kind of guide us through what's coming, what's currently in progress. Um, what are current issues and we kind of discuss like these are things that need to be documented um, or these are things that need to be improved or say someone found an issue that we hadn't been made aware of so we talk to them a lot um, and just um, in general we also talk to a lot of just subject uh, matter experts besides um, the product managers so anytime we run into a feature that you're unfamiliar with and that we don't really have good re existing resources for, um, have to go talk to the subject matter expert who can explain what's going on. Um, so yeah, there's, and that'll depend on like which product you're working on, all different contexts. Um, yeah, um, aside from that, uh, we also talk to, we have good education team here at Redis as well. They're very helpful resources, talk to them a lot and um, technical enablement. So yeah, there's, we talk to a lot of different people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get, like you say, you're not going to be able to get all the information that you need. Yeah. And as we touched upon earlier, because you're not necessarily the subject matter expert, mm -hmm. you do need things explained to you in a lot of different ways to really kind of get to the essence of what it is so that then you can translate that to the next person through your documentation. Mm -hmm. So um, how many, I'm kind of staying with you, Rachel, on this one. So how many mm -hmm. projects are you working on at once? Because you, you mentioned quite a lot of different people there. How mm -hmm. many projects have you got at the moment? Mm, so this is actually probably a better question for Lance since, um, <laughs> like he said earlier, um, basically anything that Caitlin and I can't get to, he is taken care of uh, for the most part. Um, like I said, lately I've been mostly focused on uh, infrastructure and REST API. And then like I had a little bit of stuff in the cloud, a little bit of stuff in the software besides um, the uh, REST API. Um, so yeah, it really just depends. It depends. Um, like I know Caitlin's been very devoted to Kubernetes, but she still sometimes gets pulled into other things. It kind of just depends, uh, especially on like when releases are upcoming because there's always big pushes then where it's like, okay, well we have to get this documentation covered in time for the release so that like, the new features don't show up and users are like confused by the changes or like don't know how to um, deal with the new changes. So yeah. 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 It definitely think, changes a lot. Yeah. It definitely yeah. also sounds like you've got a, variety, a lot of variety going on. So mm -hmm. it's not like you're on this one thing for months and you don't have anything else. Cause I think mm -hmm. that's probably a surefire way to not get anything done. If you, <laughs> if you kind of like, Oh, I really don't know what I want to say about this today at least you can go on to something else and think, mm -hmm. right, what can I write about this other thing? Because I think anybody who's tried to write anything has mm -hmm. often found themselves kind of thinking, I don't know what to put on this. Yeah, it and is It is a good 
like work around for if you ever end up with writer's block is okay maybe you're having trouble with a specific thing but yeah there's some other document you can go work on in the meantime and maybe when you come back you'll have fresh eyes and it'll be easier um, to get back into it when you return yeah yeah so that leads on to my next question which i'm going to ask caitlin so how do you plan out what you're going to write because i know if i was going to write a business document if i was going to write a strategy I know how I would kind of plan that out, but how do you plan out your documentation? Um, so we basically do it based on what we see the biggest need as, um, you know, we would love to be able to um, just overhaul every single and be able to touch every single article and push out this new shiny, um, perfect uh, <laughs> document set of documentation, but it really has to be a, uh, um, continuous process. And so there's a lot of prioritizing what is going to have the biggest impact um, in the next week. Um, what is the biggest feature for this next release? Um, what, you know, you really have to think about how you dedicate your time. Uh, we work in a agile environment. So we um, plan our work in two week sprints, which kind of helps us limit our scope because, you know, literally, you know, everything needs to be done. So we have to narrow it down to what am I going to do in this next two weeks and what can I reasonably accomplish? Um, and sometimes you don't get to do as much as you would like to, but you just have to put it out there and come back to it later when, um, you know, you are, have taken care of some other higher priority stuff. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And I think that's interesting to folks that are watching what you just said about the sprint because i'm not sure that's something that people necessarily realized uh, but also maybe folks that don't work in tech maybe don't work in sprints so that may be something that's actually welcome that it's quite a sort of a self-contained module of work isn't it yeah so, oh, yeah sorry go. yeah um a lot of times like documentation is kind of hard to do in an agile environment because uh you know usually you you know, we, none of us are, all three of us are not working on the same content. We're not working towards the same end goal. So um, sometimes in the past I've been on um, like part of the developer scrum team or, um, you know, we do um, documentation um, with our team here. And it really just helps you kind of continuously prioritize and be really, really realistic. And it really helps us plan. Um, so when somebody says, hey, can I, when can I get this? And we'll say, well, not in this next two weeks, um, it'll have to go in the next sprint. Yeah, I know that definitely helps, especially since there's only three of you for the whole company as well. So that definitely is a good framework to use to, to help you manage that. So just on the whole um, quality assurance, and we did talk a little bit about QA before. Um, Lance, can you tell us what does the documentation quality assurance process look like? And really who tests the documentation? Because I think people don't realize actually documentation should be tested out on somebody, shouldn't it? Somebody needs to have a look at it. And because I know I've written stuff that I think makes sense and I've given it to somebody and they're like, what did you mean by that? So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, Rachel touched on this a little bit. Um, we have, uh, like with software, we have a uh, multi-tier test process. Um, we often run uh, Hugo locally so that we can preview the article as it would be up here on screen to a reader if it was published. Uh, we look at that before we check it in, hopefully. Uh, we catch most of the typos. Um, we submit a PR. Uh, and then we uh, request reviews from the other writers. Uh, Rachel's really good at spotting the typos I missed, hence my Twitter handle. <laughs> um, I speak fluent typo, yes. Um, you know, Caitlin's very good about catching my wording and uh, letting me know when I write things that are unclear. We also get reviews from our product managers and our subject matter experts. And uh, I also go a little bit farther and try to get reviews from other people who are interested. My poor wife is learning too much about databases. <laughs> She's a paralegal. Um, <laughs> so we'll leave that alone. Um, so the idea is we just get a lot of people looking at it to make sure that it's right. There are some things that we can do that touch back to your earlier question about docs as code. 
Um, we use automation to try to pick up things. So for example, Hugo has a feature that lets us know if we've misspecified a link um, and it won't compile until we fix the link. Um, unfortunately, that only works on internal links. So if we have external links or local anchors, so we're working on some automation for that, things of that nature. Um, the, uh, so yeah, it's an iterative process. Um, sometimes, as Caitlin said, we uh, triage a request, break it down into the specific tasks and say, well, we've only got a couple of hours, so here's the tasks we think we can accomplish, or which ones, and we work with the, um, the sponsors, the product managers, to say which ones are most important to you. Um, and we negotiate the schedule for when we're going to work on all of the various tasks. Some of them will happen in short term, some of them medium term, some of them longer. We also try to uh, make sure that there's a coherence throughout the entire narrative, that the docs are continuously improving at a macro level or a meta level. And so one of the things that I'll do is I'll just sit down and I'll just go through the docs and read them. Um, sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes early in the morning, just trying to get other parts of my brain involved to make sure that things are making sense. So in many respects, it's a similar process that I followed when I was a dev. And so I've tried to bring some more disciplines to that. Mm, yeah, we talked about Docs as code earlier. So yeah, that definitely kind of fits in because the two things go hand in hand. So why not, why not apply some of those best practices that are tried and tested? So yeah, I think it's time now to break up the case again and do another quick fire round, the final quick fire round of this panel discussion. And it's Caitlin's turn. You've been looking forward to this, haven't you, Caitlin? Okay. Sure. Uh, Caitlin, what's your favourite word? Bamboozled. Yeah, nice. So you've got bewildered, squishy, <laughs> and bamboozled. Nice. And your your favourite book? Um, I would. The one that comes to mind that I've read recently is The Night Circus by um, Aaron Morgenstern. I need to check all these books out, yeah. I mean, just checking out the Kindle probably isn't a very useful recommendation. <laughs> anyway. um, and your favorite site for writing resources? Um, right now it's the Kubernetes documentation um, because that's a project that I'm working on. It also referenced the Google style guide um, quite often. It, because this um, style is slightly different from my last position, so I'm I'm learning how to be more friendly in um, my tone. Uh, so I use the Google Style Guide quite a lot um, to make sure that I'm being consistent. Cool. Yeah, and uh, we'll go when we do the one to one. We'll talk more about your Kubernetes journey as well, because I think that's really interesting. Um, talking about technical writing, because as we said earlier. People think technical writers know everything, but actually Kubernetes is something that you've taken some courses on in this job to help you to to be better at writing about it as well. So we'll, we'll go in that more um, in a couple of weeks' time when we do, when we do the one-to-one. -one. I think that'd be a really interesting place to hear. Um, and then finally, for you, what's better, a good product with bad docs or a bad product with good docs? I like... Both of them said, like, neither are really that great. Um, I would say if you don't have good documentation, especially if it's like software, um, it's basically unusable. So even the bad product with good docs could be used. Um, and I would say that would be better, more useful in that context. Hmm. Yeah, OK, good. No, it's nice to hear what everybody thought about that one. And like I said, there's no right answer. And it's a bit of a silly question anyway. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for humoring me on that one, everybody. So just like into the final stretch here and just the last few questions. So any of you good people that are watching on Twitch, please do uh, type questions in the chat. Unfortunately, those of you on YouTube won't be able to do that. But if you did want to join us on Discord and ask any questions, then we feel free to do so. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Simon Prickett, who is behind the scenes here, pressing all the buttons. He's our developer advocacy manager. So thanks so much, Simon, for helping us to make this stream happen today. So like I said, these are just the final questions. And we're going to so much more depth with these three uh, folks here on the Docs team in the one-to-ones in the week commencing Monday the 25th of October. So don't worry about that. If you've got any questions between now and then, bring them to those sessions and we'll, we'll get through them then. 
So I'm going to come to uh, Rachel because Rachel, mm -hmm. you mentioned this earlier that you were a software engineer and now you're a technical writer. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what sort of portfolio is useful to have when you're going for technical writing roles? Because obviously you've, you've been at the company a short while and Lance has already said that he really enjoyed reading both mm -hmm. of your uh, writing samples. So tell us a little bit about the portfolio mm -hmm. that you would recommend people build mm -hmm. up. So um, it can be like a challenge to like get a portfolio together, um, especially because like if you've, so like I did do documentation at my software engineering job because we didn't always have technical writers who had time to be dedicated to the products I was working on. So um, I liked doing documentation um, and would do that. But, you know, it was not things that I could share because it was company property, right? So I couldn't bring it with me. Um, so basically, um, some of the writing samples I gave were actually from an old like research paper I did from college. So basically we had like, um, we always did like a senior seminar project and I did mine on um, adding AI to Minecraft. Uh, <laughs> this was back in uh, 2014. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. Um, and so I just kind of gave that as one of my writing samples. And then I also, um, wrote from scratch, um, a quick start guide, uh, based on like a command line utility, um, for like copying, like basically database metadata, um, between different environments and stuff. So, um, I also had that out and that was more, uh, similar <laughs> to what, you know, I'd be writing, um, professionally. Um, something that's really helpful that I didn't do, so I say it's helpful, it should be helpful, is a lot of people will get involved in open source projects, documentation projects. Um, that is something that is definitely recommended uh, to writers who don't have a portfolio existing or maybe don't know what to write about on their own. Um, so like write the docs, I think keeps like a list of open source uh, documentation product uh, projects that are like, yes, we're open to the public, come help us. Um, so that's an option. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that uh, and you don't have any existing documents, um, I would recommend maybe writing some like procedures or instructions based on something that you use every day. Um, I don't know if you have like an art program you use a lot or you know just anything you're interested. In. Maybe you wanna write a guide to how to accomplish some task on like Steam. Um, do that, you know, maybe um, show it to some like friends or family or to someone you know who's unfamiliar with it and see if they can follow it. <laughs> and that'll give you some good feedback on does what I wrote like make sense. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of ways you can approach getting a portfolio together, I think, um, if you're new. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, anybody here who's tried to get into coding is similar sort of advice, isn't it? Just make something um that you're interested in mm -hmm. and put it put it up um but yeah so would you recommend that people create a, like a website or have examples online or did you just send those examples in when you applied for the job how would how would you do that i just i just sent um mine directly uh but if yeah if you have um the time to get a website set up go for it like i think that um can look really good and uh, honestly, like if you already, if you're getting experience with static site generation um, before uh, getting hired somewhere that wants a static site generated website, um, that's a really good way to show, hey, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. A lot of people, including myself, have a personal website that was mm -hmm. created using a static site generator. So, yeah, if you want to get into documentation and the place that you want to work is doing that, that's a really good way, like you say, mm -hmm. of showing that you do know how to do it because otherwise the website wouldn't be up there. Cool, mm -hmm. okay, thanks for that. So Caitlin, I know that um, you had a different route into technical writing career, which we won't go into depth now. We will save that for when we have the one-to-one, -one. but could you briefly just tell us what skills did you bring from previous roles or industries into technical writing? Because I think there's gonna be some people watching that have no experience maybe in tech or technical writing, they want to get into this, and they probably do have some transferable skills that they could bring. Yeah, um, definitely. I had zero tech experience when I started as a technical writer, but um, the main skills that made me 
I mean, got me hired were that I was really good at research and I was really good at um, explaining uh, like really complicated concepts so that they were easy to understand. Um, so I, uh, I got hired right out of college, so I used a lot of my research papers for that. Um, but they weren't related to tech at all. <laughs> um, but just, you know, being able to research and write clearly are very important skills in technical writing. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, um, you go off and look at all different things. There are all different media that you could look at and consume to inform. And like Rachel said, you interface with lots of different people in the company and get their point of view and try and fill in the gaps that way. So yeah, definitely agree with that research piece. Um, you need to kind of know the tools to use to go and find information. So it kind of parts back to what we were saying before, that people think that technical writers know everything. You don't need to know everything, just like a coder doesn't need to know everything. You just kind of need to know where to look and some flavor of the tools that might be available to you and how to deploy them as well. So we're coming right to the end now. We're nearly on the hour. So this is going to be my last question. It is a bit of a big one, but Lance, I know you can handle this. Uh, <laughs> how much has technical writing changed over the, say, past five to 10 years? Because tech has changed a lot over the past five to 10 years or any time period that you that you want to choose. I chose that arbitrarily, but tell us a bit about how technical writing has changed in your uh, time in the industry. I would say that it's changed vastly. Um, yeah, with the uh, development of social media, with Twitter becoming so prominent, uh, in some to some degree, uh, tech writing has had to pretty much follow along. People don't read for depth anymore. Uh, they only scan things, and they don't have patience for walls of text, which means that the old academic approach of here's all the background before I get to the meat has to be flipped on its head. I would say these days we're far more journalistic, um, but journalistic for the video and cryon age. Um, so that we have to just really focus on, here's the lead, that's all you need to know, solve your problem. Um, and tech writing has to be very focused on solving the problem. Going back to one of the earliest questions you asked, what is the purpose of uh, documentation? Ultimately, it's to help customers solve problems. That's why they read it. So let's let them get in, get out, and move on with their lives. Um, tech writing has to change similarly. And so we learn how to write quickly. We learn how to write briefly. We learn how to be scannable. There's also a lot more emphasis on empathy these days, being aware of where your audience is and choosing words to um, you know, keep them engaged. This is something we see in a larger structure. Um, so there's terminology that you know used to be okay and is becoming less okay, especially as we get into an international audience, especially as we get uh, into an intercultural audience. Um, and so tech writing has to be like, oh, well, we just can't write in jokes that make us laugh. We have to be careful about how those jokes land to other people who don't understand our popular culture. So there's a lot of um, um, subtle variations, um, but it all boils down to be quick, be brief, be clear. Um, most importantly, be accurate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. If we were going to sum up, you know, what makes good documentation, I think that's a really good place to end. So, yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for joining uh, for joining me today on this panel discussion. It's been really nice chatting with you. I look forward to chatting with you all on a one-to-one -one basis in a couple of weeks' time. So don't forget to join us. Press follow on Twitch to get a notification when we go live. But in the meantime, please do diarise all the events are going to be at the same time as this one so 9 a.m pacific noon eastern 4 p.m uh, utc and 5 p.m uk time i've got one-to-one -one with caitlin on monday the 25th of october then i've got rachel on tuesday the 26th of october and then i've got lance on friday the 29th of october hopefully there will be cats involved in there but i can't guarantee you're just going to have to turn up and see if any cats come along so yeah, um, but also don't forget to check out our Hacktoberfest page. We, uh, me and Simon are managing that project. 
So we're going to be drip feeding some more issues over the coming weeks of October. Please do come and check those out. There's going to be some documentation ones as well as software ones. People have really got stuck in so far. So watch this space for some more content on that. So yeah, we will see you again on the 25th of October for me and Caitlin having a one-to-one -one side chat. I really hope you enjoyed this event today. The recording will be up on YouTube soon and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.